Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the IR Public Webinar, December 19th, 2023. We're very lucky here to have Catherine Hoff Rothman. Uh, Catherine was born in Yellow Medicine County in Minnesota and grew up in Leung County. Both of her grandmothers are from Minneota in the Icelandic community. And she has a bachelor's degree from Moorhead College and did her senior research project on the Icelandic immigration and assimilation in North America. Uh, after college, she married her sweetheart, her high school college sweetheart, Ken Rothman, and they spent some years in New Jersey where Catherine became a minister and started a family. Later, they moved back to Minnesota where Catherine gave 30 years of service to the Lutheran church as a minister. Her ama taught her how to knit in the dark when she was 10. And in her spare time, she loves reading British TV, singing um, in a chorale and preaching on Sunday, and also visiting fam family, friends, and colleagues. While traveling with the Snorri Plus program in 2022, she and her husband, Ken, renewed their wedding vows at Hofkirche in Vapnefjordur with Kathy Joseph Josephson officiating. <clears throat> so that's really fantastic and um, related to the scene behind me here. Uh, today, Catherine is going to talk about the Minneota Icelandic community um, and let us know about its history and its current state. So take it away, Catherine, and thank you for being here. Sure. Okay. Well, I'm not the most qualified person to talk about Minneota because I graduated from the rival school to the east uh, from Cottonwood, but I grew up in a farm that was just east of Minneota, and uh, Minneota has always been a part of our family's life. But I think I was like that that fly that buzzes around your head, you know, that's so annoying, uh, because whenever we were having Icelandic Roots uh, organizations and uh, talking about things, everyone always was talking about Canada or about the West Coast community. And I was always saying, what about Minneota? What about Minneota? And so finally, Suna called and asked if I would uh, just do something about Minneota because it wasn't something being mentioned very much. So I've got a PowerPoint that I'm going to put together. And hopefully at the end of this, we'll have a chance to do some questions or some folks who are also uh, from the Minneota community can tell some stories. So here we go. So welcome to Minneota. This is... Uh, the community that is the village portion of the Icelandic community there. Uh, most of the folks that I know were from farms in around the area, but there is also the village. And it's a place that is about to celebrate its 150th anniversary of Icelandic immigration to the Minneota area. And we're just in the kind of kicking around ideas stage there, uh, but something will be happening in 2025 to, to celebrate. So I have had a lot of help with this. Um, Mary Bysey was really helpful in getting me some material. Wendy Sarzen at the at the big store uh, at the Minneota Public Library too. Uh, Pat Brennecke, Diana Konsky. Kathy Josephson has been very helpful. And I asked Kathy if she had anything to add um, to put it in the chat because she's having some problems with her voice and she's not supposed to, to talk very much. And also I want to highlight um, all of the information from Hofsas from the Immigration Center as well. So there are a lot of resources if you're interested in, in finding out some more. But the first question was simply, where is Minnesota or Minneota? If you take a look at the map of Minnesota, Canada is all the way up here. Winnipeg is about up here with Gimli, just nearby. Mountain North Dakota is a little bit south of that again. And then you go all the way down here to the three counties uh, that are the Icelandic community. It's Lyon County, and over here is Lincoln County, and this long skinny thing is Yellow Medicine County. And this is where the majority of the folks uh, settled. And so that gives you some idea. The first person uh, to settle in the area of Icelandic descent was Gunnlaugur Petterson, and he came from Wisconsin. 
it was um, about 500 miles in three weeks uh, with uh, a cart and, and a wagon. Uh, and he came with some neighbors from Wisconsin who were Norwegians. And so that's where we ended up. To give you another idea of where Miniota is uh, with some, some more familiar places, if you are in Gimli and you want to go to Miniota, it's going to take you over eight hours. It's 520 miles. If you're coming from Mountain, it's a little bit closer. If you are coming from Minneapolis, about, about two and a half hours, uh, give or take, depending upon where you're going. But it's a trip, and this is by car. So you can imagine if you were traveling by some other way, it would take you longer for sure. One thing I wanted to check on, just out of dumb curiosity, considering that most Icelanders had lived close to the sea, uh, I thought, how far is it? So if you want to drive to the Pacific Ocean, it's going to take you over 22 hours. If you're going to drive to the Atlantic Ocean, 20 to 25 hours, depending upon your route. Even to go north to Hudson Bay, it's over 1,300 miles. I didn't even bother with um, the Gulf of Mexico because by this time you kind of figured out that you were landlocked. In fact, my great-great-grandfather had spent a lot of his life on the sea and he was very homesick for the sea. He, uh, their, their house was kind of up on a rise and you could look across at the fields. And he always said that when the flax and oats and things were in, in, uh, in the wind, and they would kind of ripple. That would make him feel a little bit better because it reminded him of his life in the sea. Very different. This is taken in Vapnafjörður, where you're right on the water. Here you're in southwestern Minnesota with seas of corn. Very flat area. Same thing here. This is taken just a little bit west of Vapnafjörður. Looks nothing like the places where people came to settle. Um, especially the, the higher ground here is just so terribly different. This was um, the typical form of a glacial carved valley. And there is a portion of the Icelandic community in Lincoln County that also has a, a glacial formation there but not any way, anywhere near as uh, lovely as this, really. So what is Miniata? Well, it's about 1,300 people live there now. It's a, a very typical small town in southwestern Minnesota. Farming is a big deal there. It's also a bedroom community. Uh, the county seat marshal is not that far away on the highway, so it's a place to work and then you can live in a smaller town if you like. Growing up, I knew Miniota as a powerhouse for sports and um, they were always tough. They were always tough to beat. And you can see by this that they got a lot of state championships for a small place. I think the first question that I ever had was, why would you leave a place that was familiar, where your family had been for generations, where the people you knew were all there? What would, what would make you leave? And there's really two reasons why people leave. Either they are pulled away because there's something so entrancing and such an advantage that uh, you just have to go. You know, it's an adventure, it's an advantage. Or you are pushed away. You're pushed out because you simply cannot stay and survive. And so uh, I, if you are interested in this, I think this is just such a fabulous resource for you to go to the Immigration Center website. Under the Immigration tab, there's tons and tons of information about who left, the percentages, when, all that kind of stuff. And then as you continue to scroll down, um, the timeline goes year by year. And it doesn't talk about politics or anything like that, but 
if you know the year that your um, ancestors left Iceland, you can find out what the fishing was like, what the weather was like, what the harvest was like. Um, sometimes there are comments about, you know, people wandering and begging and starving. And so it gives you a very clear uh, notion about why people left. And that was the first question I really had was why? Why go? Why go at all? I had not thought about this. When you move to a new place, you have two options. Either you can isolate yourself. In other words, you can try and recreate the place that you left, avoid contamination uh, or influence from other cultures around. Um, that's one choice. And that's very often attractive to the older members of an immigrant community where the notion of having to learn in a, a new language work in a new place is just overwhelming. And so they can kind of isolate at home and, and be more comfortable. But this is an option that some, some groups choose. Second option is to accept the fact that you're moving to a new place and you have a lot to learn if you're going to thrive there. So you adapt where it is reasonable, but you preserve the language, the culture, the food, the traditions, the things that preserve your identity. So this is a form of integration, but with that, that sense of identity, very much uh, an important piece of it. Why this corner of Southwestern Minnesota? Well, here's where a story starts. Um, I know that the Canadians know of Reverend Paul Thorlaxon. Um, the story with the Minnesota community is this. He had attended seminary and had come to know some uh, Norwegian seminarians. Uh, he served in Wisconsin for a period of time. And as the Icelanders were coming, early Icelanders, he helped them find work with Norwegian farmers uh, in Wisconsin with the idea that by doing that, they would be able to pretty much understand the Norwegians, but they could learn how to farm. Uh, because the farming in the Midwest, in, in Minnesota, is very different than the sheep farming in northeastern Iceland. And so it would give them an opportunity to learn how to farm, to get some funds, to get themselves established, to learn some language. And so that's what happened. Um, there were a number of, of people who did that, including that first settler, uh, Gunnlaugr. Uh, who made the trip then with some Norwegian neighbors. And, and uh, one of the references told me that their name was Hubdesvin, and I know the Hubdesvin. I went to school with the Hubdesvins. Um, so he had also gone with a friend of his to scout out a place, not necessarily looking for empty land, but looking for a place where there was enough land available that Icelanders would be able to find farms and places to live. And he had found the community uh, and his brother Niels uh, served as the pastor of the Lutheran churches here for quite some time um, early on. There's another view of early Miniota. You can see there's not a tree to be had. It's just open, open prairie. Most of the village had in, uh, I'm sorry, it was uh, called Pompa. Then later, this village was called Yellow Medicine Crossing because of the Yellow Medicine. 1875, the railroad tracks were laid um, in reference to an area in Norway. But it was thought to be too confusing because of uh, another town or another place called Norseland. And so they decided on a new name. And there was a lot of back and forth about this. The name Miniota had been suggested early on, but it had lost favor. Uh, a lot of people wanted to call it Jaegersville after an early settler. And uh, finally, they decided they were going to have a vote. Now, January 21, 1881 is when the village was actually established. But that was in the middle of a really harsh, nasty winter. They decided they were going to vote, but the votes were never counted. 
there are various stories about what happened, but most of them point to this. There was a fellow who had a store in town, Doc Seals, and he approved of the name Miniota. And so it sounds like he had secretly sent in an application to have the place named the Village of Miniota, unbeknownst to anybody. Um, as they were going to count the votes, the mail arrived, and with it came an official letter from Washington, D.C., granting permission to name this new town Miniota. And that ended the whole thing. And from what I can read, the, the votes were never taken or never counted. The reason that this area of Minnesota was available was it had been Indian land for a long time and mostly used for hunting and trapping. Um, most of the Sioux, and I hate to call them Sioux, I should call them Dakota, uh, because that's the more respectful term. But most of them lived along the timberlands where more permanently, but they, they uh, did hunting for buffalo and did trapping uh, out in the prairie areas. In 1851, a treaty was made with the U.S. government and by that treaty, a large portion of southwestern Minnesota was purchased from the Dakota people at a price of about 12 cents an acre. But the government reneged. The promised payments did not come. Um, the Dakota people who were counting on it were not happy about that. In 1862, when the United States was involved in the Civil War, uh, some of the younger warriors decided this was a time to push out the, the settlers. And there was a war that lasted for one month, which still has quite an impact in Minnesota. At least if you grow down, up down in southwestern Minnesota, it's something you're very well aware of. The upshot of that was pretty tragic. There was the largest mass hanging in U.S. history happened of some of the the Dakota men who had been involved in the war. Dakota people were kicked out of Minnesota and to this day still think of it as the homeland they've been exiled from. But it opened it up for settlement. And so that whole corner of southwestern Minnesota, you'll find a lot of towns, a lot of churches that are all about the same age because this is when the rush of immigrants really happened. So in 1875, Gunlager Peterson settles on the Riverside Farm on the banks of the Yellow Medicine River. A few years later, the Irish and the English arrive. 1881, uh, Bishop Ireland encouraged Belgians and Hollanders to arrive. And so it's a very cosmopolitan mixed area uh, culturally. where they come from? Well, this is from Kathy Josephson. Of the 1,000-plus people from Vapna Fjord, there are about 300 went to southwestern Minnesota. It's a big chunk of your population. About a third of the people you know left. And where did they come from? Well, from Vapna Fjord, but also then from these close-by areas. And I know within my family, um, all of these places keep popping up. People were moving around from place to place quite a lot. And so, um, you know, they're born here and they live here and then they live over here and somebody's baptized there and then they're here and then they're back there. It's just just uh, all over the place. Uh, the Osman family were the ones that uh, Kathy mentioned in particular. And this information comes from her So. Very quickly, uh, there were four settlements. The eastern settlement, Westerheim, was the oldest one. That's where Gunlager came. Um, the church was established there. And um, the original church burned down in 1913. That was not uncommon because a lot of churches, the idea was that God would protect God's house, therefore forget about things like lightning rods. And so the burning of churches was not unusual, especially in the prairie where the steeple is the tallest thing around. It was rebuilt. And then I remember um, when it was, the building was sold, 
the congregation had actually dissolved in about 1955 and had gone into the church in town, St. Paul's. They were moving the building. Uh, it was it had been purchased by a, a church in Marshall, and it fell off the moving dolly, whatever you call it, and just kind of fell apart. And so I remember as a kid going there and picking up some of the little pieces of stained glass from the windows that were just shattered on the ground. But the cemetery um, is where a lot of my people are, and um, it's well cared for, but it's a, a spot to check out. Here next to it is just a shot taken next to the cemetery. This is what southwestern Minnesota looks like, so different from the northeast. One of the other places uh, was the Western Settlement. This is southwest of Minneota. There was a, a small number of families who moved there. Some of them liked the idea that it looked a little bit more like Iceland. Um, it was also land that was available after much of the other land had been taken up. The Eastern Settlement has some of the richest farmland in Minnesota. It's very good stuff for growing things. This land is partially formed by some of the, the debris of the glaciers that, you know, kind of pushed and shoved and then dropped things as they, they retreated. So uh, Lincoln County has, if you follow the road here, Lincoln County has a lot more deep hills and valleys and and uh, just a, a more, more rugged uh, terrain, uh, a little sandier soil as well for farming. This was a, a settlement, the original purpose of this, and I don't know that it ever had a, a church name. Um, it was originally formed and it was called the Progressive Society. It had two aims. One was to preserve the Christian religion in its purity. And the other was to maintain the Icelandic language in its purity. And so it had a dual purpose from the very beginning. Later on, the name was changed to the Reading Society. And to my knowledge, I don't know that it ever had another name other than we always called it the Lincoln County Church. If you have read uh, Bill Holmes' book, The Music of Failure, and his lovely um, essays about Polly, or Pauline Bardal, uh, she was the organist. This is the church that that he used to go to while she uh, tried to preserve the, the organ from rodents after it closed and where Paul or where, uh, Bill would go along with her. These are just two shots of the same, of the, of the uh, church here, the two different churches. It too uh, had problems. Whoops. There was a Marshall, Minnesota church um they originally met in in homes um so the folks who went to marshall were largely people who had a trade or some kind of thing that would make sense to be in in that uh in town they would read the sermons by jon uh Villen. the church itself was established then in 1887 and was served from time to time. Visiting pastors would come through, including uh, Paul Thorlaxon. Um They would uh, do the baptisms and they would confirm the kids when they passed through. But eventually uh, it, was, it was a church that was served by the one pastor who served the other churches to all four of them. Church was built in 1891, destroyed in 1892. Rebuilt, but then it disbanded and the church became a private residence. So now we're in Minneota itself. If you go to Minneota, you have to go to the big store. That's all there is to it. It is a big deal. Um, at one time, Minneota had the largest retail facility uh, in the West. I mean, it was such a big deal. I remember going to this store when I was a little kid and I remember buying fabric there for my 4-H projects and, and stuff. And, and it was just this wonderful experience of 
stepping back in time, uh, things crammed to the ceiling. And one of the clerks worked there for 60 years. Uh, it, it was just a wonderful place. And you had those kind of zip things, you know, where you put your money in and it zips up someplace. And they make the the uh, change and then it comes back with your receipt. And uh, it was it was just a treat to get to go there. Miniota also has its very own book by Bill Holm, where it says the heart can be filled anywhere on earth. And then it says Miniota, Minnesota. As you may know, Bill traveled all over the place. He always said that the greatest wish of his life when he was young was to see Miniota in the rearview mirror. And he was going to go to the big city and do big things and stuff. And yet he ended up coming back to Miniota and making it his home. And he writes about it. In town is the fourth church. This is St. Paul's Lutheran. This is the one church that remains uh, open and active. And I've been to a few funerals here. And in fact, back in the day, Bill Holm used to sing in Iceland at uh, some of those funerals. It's a pretty little place. If you go to Miniota, when you go to Miniota, in front of St. Paul's, you will find this memorial plaque that celebrates the first settlement here uh, of Icelanders in, in Minnesota. So you'll want to check that out. Here's the big store. This is what it used to look like. It's kind of hard to see. These old pictures don't reproduce very well. But it's crammed with clothing here. And there was stuff going up to the ceiling and shelves. And there was a basement down below. You can see that, that the tin ceiling has been maintained here. And it is now the public library. And it's really nice. There's a, an area in the front where you can sit and play chess or whatever. Uh, it's a very comfortable place to spend some time. And they do have materials about the history of the Miniota area there. If you go upstairs, and they now have an elevator there, which is a good thing. Uh, if you go upstairs in the big store, you'll find the opera house. This was kind of the big cultural, social place uh, in Minota for a long time. Plays and dances and all sorts of things were held there. It was restored back, I guess, in the late 70s, probably. And um, it's now used for special events. The portion of it is a museum. Uh, you can have events there if you like. But it, again, it's well well maintained. There is a sort of Society for the Preservation of Miniota History that has been responsible for a lot of the work there. I have to mention Box Elder Days. It's a three-day annual event held the weekend after Labor Day every September. Um, originally, it was called Town and Country Days. But they felt like they needed to do something different. And uh, the name Box Elder Days was adapted in 1990. Bill Holm had just written a book called Box Elder Variations, a book about box elder bugs. If you're from southwestern Minnesota, you know about box elders. They are these everywhere present, harmless little creatures that just seem to be everywhere uh, at certain times of the year. And... Um, you have box elder trees. They're just all sorts of stuff. But it's gotten to be quite a celebration. So if you Google box elder bug days, uh, you get an idea of what goes on, what to expect if you go. You should go. I had a lot of resources, but these are a couple of them that were very helpful. Um, the first two are books that are available. Icelanders in North America, The First Settlers uh, by Jonas Thor is a, a really good resource if you want to know more. This, of course, covers more than just Miniota. Um, there were other settlements in Roseau County, uh, up near the Canadian border in Minnesota. 
there were most of the people I knew lived in the St. Paul area if they lived in the Twin Cities. Um, some of the relatives ended up in Washington Island or other parts of Wisconsin. Um, but it's a, a very good, good source. They chose Minnesota uh, covers a lot of different ethnic groups. And I know a lot of people are not um, FBI, full-blooded Icelanders. So if you have, and that should say survey, um, if you have other ethnic roots uh, that are in Minnesota, this covers a whole lot of different things. The two books that were produced by St. Paul's Lutheran Church are quite different from each other and uh, are very helpful for people who are looking for some genealogy information. Um, let me just grab them here. The first one, the 90 years of St. Paul has a series of interviews by some longtime early uh, residents. Some of them are immigrants. Yeah, something just dipped out. Uh, they the the biographies that are in this book uh, include people who transferred from the other churches into St. Paul's. So if you know an ancestor or someone even more current, uh, there are pictures in here, um, all sorts of things, uh, uh, just little bios that, uh, you know, if, if you're looking for information on an ancestor, this is a great place to go. So those are, are probably not as available, but um, I know they have them at the big store. And then um, there's the Centennial Histories of Miniota, which is a really good source. I'll, and I found that at the big store library and also of Lyon County. Lyon County had a couple of very good um, history uh, books done. One was in 1912. Most of the information is quoted in the later volumes. So uh, the 1971 is a, a good source as well. So there's lots of, lots of stuff there. So beyond that, I think a lot of it's just the storytelling um, of things that happened. Probably the story I heard about the most was the the big bunch of people who came in 1879. Uh, at that time, the population of Minnesota was about 113. And at that time, about approximately 160 people came from Iceland all at the same time. And um, they had trouble with their tickets. They didn't have tickets to go all the way. Jack Frost had to meet them and make arrangements uh, and uh, they finally arrived in Minneota, and then there wasn't housing enough for them. The town had more than doubled its population when they arrived. So they were housed in livery stables. And I think one of the old timers said chicken houses, anything with walls and a roof until they could figure out where to put them. Um, but there are lots of stories to be told about things that have happened there. So. That's pretty much what I've got. So I'm just curious what we've got for uh, any kinds of questions or hopefully other people have some stories as well. Thank you. That was fantastic. Uh, I'm going to stop the share here. So yeah, there we go. Yeah. Um, if people have questions in the Q&A, feel free to put them in there. Um, while we're waiting for those, I think I will ask a question. I was fascinated by this presentation. Sure. Uh, my family also went to Minnesota, um, and I've been interested in this question of religion and the fact that you're uh, a minister. This is fantastic because you were probably interested too, and <laughs> you probably. Learned. But um, from what I know, um, yeah, there were several beloved priests in the Vopnafirda area before they left. Um, Halder Jonsson was. Um, known to really serve the people and there was a tremendous poverty and infant mortality and, and he was uh, quite helpful and so was his wife. Um, and then there was another priest in the uh, area, uh, Bergen Thor, Thor, Thor Bergson, and he um, was also beloved in a lot of Western Icelanders, particularly from Minneota area, 
carry the name Bergman, even to this day, because it's passed down from that. But I do know that um, there was some delay in accepting the church charter in Minneota, that they weren't quick. And maybe you've read about this, but, um, yeah. and I wonder if that has to do with the compulsion of religion there as compared to in the United States, or what, what do you think, what do you know about that? Or, or what can you tell us about that? I know that there were a couple of different things going on. One was this kind of dual purpose for the formation of churches, that it was not only just to be a worshiping religious organization, but also a preservation of language. And so they were uh, confirming people in Iceland for quite a while, and there was a real effort to do that. Uh, another issue that came up was with Paul Thorlaxen, because he had gone to a Norwegian seminary, there were some people who were suspicious that his theology had been pushed a little bit to be more like the Norwegian church yeah. than like the Icelandic church. And so there was a little bit of suspicion about, about that. The other was that uh, we know that people are going through very hard times when they were in in Iceland, and that um, the state church was established and that you had to pay your your dues or fees or whatever you call them, uh, whether you attended or believed or not. And so for a lot of people, there was this kind of sense of freedom. You know, <laughs> There's no state church here. We don't have to be a part of this thing unless we want to. And so it's I, I have read that some of the early pastors felt that it was a difficult field to work in because of those folks. On the other hand, there were people who were very, very uh, devout, uh, including uh, my grandmother's foster father, who was actually her great uncle. Uh, he was a very devout man. And uh, for him, getting a church established very early on was very important. And grandma said, if we didn't have the church, we sat dressed up in the living room and we sang hymns and we had sermons read and we had church at home. We simply did not miss this thing. And I think it's partially because uh, Sigbjörn had become very ill when he was 19. He was living, we're not sure if he was studying or just working at uh, with the priest at Hofteger. Mm -hmm. um, but he he became quite ill, and at 19, the only thing they thought would be helpful would be to get to a doctor, but that meant walking to Akureyri, uh, which, when you think about it, is just insane, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, on the way there, he became deathly ill, and he was bedridden for some time. Finally, he was able to complete the trip, and uh, there was problems. The doctor got sick and all sorts of things. But he kind of felt like it was by the grace of God that he had survived. And that may be the source of his devotion. But it was complex, you know. And it became especially complex as people started intermarrying a few generations down the road. And they weren't always uh, intermarrying with other Icelanders. So, um, right. The church that, that's the all church. I can tell you. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, that was a great answer. Um, in your uh, research, did you uncover anything about some of the early effort, other efforts, sort of secular efforts to keep the language going? Like I know there was an, um, an Icelandic language newspaper that was started very mm -hmm. early on. Or mm -hmm. you know, can you tell us anything about that or other, other cultural things that were done to preserve heritage? You know, um, I didn't know very much about those about the Venland, and uh, there was another from Fari, I think. Um, but I know that the homes I went to all had Logberg Times Kringla, because that was one of the places where, you know, my great uncles and aunts would read to me, and I was taught words and things like that. There, That was important. Um, I know that they read a great deal uh, whenever they could. Um, the the Minneota mascot, which is still the main paper there, uh, originally had started as an English newspaper. And it was after about nine years, uh, it was purchased by the Icelanders. 
and it became kind of the source of information about the Icelandic community. And so I, my mother took the, the mascot for quite a long time. Um, of course, she worked in Minnesota, uh, and so did my aunt, Stella. And so um, to me, Minnesota was always, I think I think I told some of you guys, this, going to Minnesota was both a treat and a horror to us as kids because it meant going to the dentist. <laughs> so if somebody said we're going to Minota, did that mean we got to go to the big store? Or did it mean we had to climb up the stairs to the dentist? And uh, Doc Eastwald would always say, a little tickled out to save a big tickle later. And then he'd jab you with Novocaine. So, you know, you try to be brave. <laughs> it's about all you can do. <laughs> That's great. There is a question from Alfreda about a um, uh, family question, which I think mm -hmm. we're compelled to take given that we're all interested in family sure. uh, we had some hoftegs in lundar and i wonder if they're connected to the hoftegs in miniota do you know anything about them i don't know for sure um i know that there are branches of the, the family uh in canada um but when sigbjorn came to this country sigbjorn uh, he was sigurd's son um he chose to take the name hofteg and he had great affection for the priest who was there, uh, the one he had worked for. In fact, uh, that priest paid for his medical care when he was in such dire straits. And he paid him back, but he he felt that he needed to honor him. And, of course, you know how it is with, with Icelanders. There's, um, the same name gets repeated, and it's very difficult to tell who's who. And it seemed like Icelanders were very quick to adapt to this country. Um people would change their names because it was difficult for their non-Icelandic neighbors to pronounce them. And so um, one guy became Ben Johnson or Ben Christensen or something like that, you know, and um, somebody else became Jones and, and there were a lot of nicknames and things, but I don't, I, I know that it's the place would be the common spot, whether or not we're still talking same family or not. That I'm not so sure. Great, great. Um, you know, one thing I wanted to discuss is that also is the natural environment because it is interesting. Uh, part of my family in Minnesota came down from Gimli, others came from Wisconsin. They both had connections in Vapnifur, the region. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the natural environment between Gimli and Mountain, all the way, all the way down to Minneota, it's all the tall grass, that strip of tall yeah. grass prairie. Yeah. And Bill Holm writes a lot about that. Did mm -hmm. you did you encounter anything about that? I mean, you mentioned actually your, I think your maybe your grandfather or great grandfather talking about the the wheat. Yeah. Um, but I'm wondering about the natural grass and uh was that particularly hard to to root out and, and as they cleared the land or what did they oh, yeah. their comments about that? And yeah. Like like I said, some of them had were able to buy land that had been started mm -hmm. where people had given up on farming. It was harder work than they thought it would be. Um but yeah, you had to bust sod, you had to do that. And it, it was hard work. It was uh, deeply rooted stuff. I think, you know, um, reading some of the things that we've done with Icelandic Roots on, on the Canadian community, um, when it talks about how Icelanders had never chopped down a tree up in Canada, and now they had to do that in order to do things, and and they had never farmed crops, and um, yeah, you know, you don't stop and think about those things, that you just kind of assume, well, farming's farming, right? And doesn't everybody know what a tree is and how to chop it down? Um, so it it was a, a real change. I know if you take a look at like um, uh, Ole Rolvag talks about people from Norway feeling very exposed when they came to Minnesota because they didn't have the, the trees and the mountains and stuff. But of course, in, in Iceland, you are kind of, it's open ground. Yeah, There are places in Iceland that look a lot like uh, the prairie. Um yeah, absolutely. And uh, even in some writings in my own family, when they first came to uh, Kinmount, mm -hmm. they were disturbed by the number of trees and how they closed in it felt. Yeah, 
I, I have felt that as a prairie person. Uh, Bill Holm talks about having a prairie eye, and prairie I have eye one. The, yeah, the prairie so eye. When, uh, yeah, the when we moved to New Jersey, I was in the middle of the woods, and I kept telling my husband, I can't see the horizon, you know, right. what's the deal? I should, say, I should say one thing. The name Minnesota drives my spell checker crazy. Because yeah. it's always trying to say, don't you mean Minnesota? Yeah. Um, it turns out that that name is really misleading. It means much water. Uh -huh. And this is not in the middle of the Lakes District <laughs> in right. Minnesota. Uh, the story goes that Doc Seals, that same guy who snuck off the application for to rename the village, mm -hmm. uh, he had watered down the liquor that he was selling to Dakota people. And one of the men came in complaining that there was too much water. And, and he used the Dakota word for much water, which is miniota, miniota, <laughs> miniota, miniota, griping about watered down liquor. Yeah. And um, for whatever reason, that name became an option and eventually became the name of the town. But but it does drive spell checkers crazy. It really, it does. I, every time I have to change it. when I Yeah, it. yeah. Uh, we have a couple of questions. So uh, Wendy Madison is asking, well, she's asked two questions. One is, what are the best resources for stories of the earliest settlers in Minnesota, 1875 to 1880? And are there photographs? The best sources for stories. Mm. I'm just grabbing the the ninety year deal here from St. Paul's. Um, that's one of the, the St. Paul's thing is one of the better ones um, as far as first hand stories. I'm looking at Jimmy Johnson's. I, my dad used to go and visit him. I used to tag along all the time. Um, they're telling often telling the stories about their parents. Or in case of uh, Kathy Josephson's uh, aunt Dora, I interviewed her when I was in college, and she was a little kid when she came over. And so the, a lot of these people who uh, have are very close to immigration or were immigrants have written some of their stories here in town. Um, I or in the book rather, I would um, even check with with the library there because the librarian is part of the Society for the Preservation of Miniota History. And whether they have some first person accounts or not, I'm not real sure, but uh, it would be worth worth uh, checking with them. Um, it's hard, I know, you know, like in my own family case, uh, on my mom's side, the house burned at one time and they lost almost everything. Um, so, some of the pictures that we have were given by other people who had a, a copy, you know, um, but it, it was hard going. I mean, they had uh, problems with bad weather early on. They had trouble with, with a crop failure early on. Uh, it was pretty typical. One of the churches was struck by lightning, right? And burned. Uh, in yeah. Washington. Two of them did. Yeah. Oh, both of the Lincoln, both Lincoln County and Westerheim did. Yeah. But like I said, it was uh, there was this sense that to put a, a lightning rod on your church steeple was not trusting God to take care of the church. Therefore, I remember just in the church I grew up in, just big fights about whether they should do this or not, you know. But it was not unusual for, for churches to burn. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they were often, by the way, they were often set on the highest ground as well. The idea being that you could see the steeple because it would be on the highest ground to begin with. And therefore, yeah. when you when you want to find the church or you want to go to church, um, you should be within four miles of a church and uh, you should be able to see it. So yeah. That's interesting. I do recall the higher ground was an issue because of the winds and, and at least for mm -hmm. St. Paul's, I believe, and uh, the church to rattle. Bill Holmes yeah. talked about the church rattling in, in the wind. Yeah, and they didn't have double pane glass, and so they got really cold <laughs> as well. Yeah. So um, it was, uh, they talk about the men, because when you have a circuit riding preacher, then you don't always get started exactly on time. Right. And you talk about the men uh, hanging out in the furnace room at the church until somebody would holler, the ministers come, and then they'd all go up and have their worship service. 
Well, we're out of time, but thank you so much, Catherine. This was an excellent presentation and really gave everyone a very thorough overview of the settlement in Minneota and its history, and we appreciate it so much. Well, I am told one of the reasons that we don't hear so much about it is because it was one of the more successful communities. And when they started, there were already some railroads and markets that were close by. And so some of the struggles other places had, uh, they were able to not experience. Not experience, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, just before we go, I want to put in a plug for anyone listening who, I know there was a question about photographs. We have an Icelandic Roots um, unknown photos project. And it's, if you're a member of Icelandic Roots, you can log in and, and find it um, on the website. And uh, there are a tremendous number of unknown photos from Minneota. I would say the majority are from Minneota. And so I, I, I highly recommend people go on there if you have relatives uh, that are from Minneota and maybe you can identify some people and, and it'll help us preserve the history better. All right, we're gonna sign off. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Doug, for hosting this. You're and welcome. Later. It's fun. <laughs>